Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we come before you today with all lessons being important. This one has a great and powerful <clears throat> importance and it should be in our lives. And we would ask the Father that you would bring that up bring that to our um, awareness and have us to understand what it is you want us to know from this lesson, have us go through the lesson in a great and efficient way, and that we would, you would provide for us the way, the thing that we would need as a takeaway from this. So we ask that you would guide our discussion in a mighty way. So Father, we just lift up your, exalt your name, um, because it is Jesus's name that is above all names and the one by which all men get saved. And we want to uh, recognize that, and we want to just understand these principles from the men as they were living these lives and women uh, during this time, and what and how we can apply it in our lives as well. So we ask for your presence here, your spirit to guide. And we thank you for everybody that's going to be able to join us and those not that they can watch the video. We thank you for that provision as well. We thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus name and for his sake as well. Amen. Amen. Okay. I'm going to put me on. Did, I'm putting me on spotlight. So I show up. So this shows up. Um, that may or may not be the best because I do like seeing y'all's faces when we talk, <laughs> but you are kind of at the top if, if I've got you pulled up on the screen. Um, okay, so this week we studied chapter eight of Acts. We are in lesson six of eight, so we're getting close to the end. I've heard from several of you about seems like the move if we move to Tuesdays is not going, is going to help some, it's not going to bother the ones otherwise. And the one question that I have is whether or not we're going to continue straight into part two or if we want to give ourselves a little bit of a break. And I kind of need to talk to my husband too because we do love summer and we love to go out on the lake so um, we may take a short break we may continue you know this summer or if it unless somebody just says I absolutely can't um, we we could potentially just put it off till like maybe August but I would kind of like to keep going um, I'm, I'm enjoying this it's really filling a bucket for me so I hope mm -hmm. it is for you as well um, and obviously you can invite others to join us. I will put it back up on the precept site, which is how some people found it, uh, found us and, um, we'll maybe even get a few more. Um, but okay. So let's move on into our lesson. We want to remind ourselves of where we are and what we're studying. So in the book of Acts, we have, um, in chapter one, we have Jesus going to heaven. There's a lot more, but there's that in chapter two, we have the Holy spirit being sent. This is the promise from the father. This is uh, Jesus had to go in order for the spirit to come as a result. The people were impacted being filled with the Holy spirit, which is a new phenomenon. Um, and they, they evidenced it by speaking in tongues, speaking in known yeah. languages. So the people around actually understood and, and could hear, but they were only speaking as the spirit led. This was not a man based. I'm going to do this thing as cool thing. Um, this was absolutely from the, from God. They went from 120 that were gathered to, at the end of the day, 3,000 were uh, in their numbers. A later chapter, we see more and more people being added at another number of 5,000, whether that's the 5,000 more or 5,000 total. We don't know. Um, really doesn't matter, but we, just seeing the numbers. This was centered in one city at this point. And what city is that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right very significant city. It, number one, it's the place Jesus told him to go. Number two, it's the place where the temple is. Um, it's the place of the center of the worship uh, because of the temple, but um, we know that worship can happen anywhere. But it's also, because I've been reading in Kings and, and First and Second Kings, it's also the place that God said that city is the city that God chose to put his name on. So it's not just, I mean, it was David's choice in some sense, but I think a lead choice to be there. Uh, we believe that the Temple Mount could very much have been the same place where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac um, on that same mount. So no coincidences, I only believe in God incidences. Mm -hmm. So um, just an amazing place and set apart by God. Um, 
and God himself. But we also saw last week that God is not confined by the temple. Um, he might have given his visual presence there in the Shekinah glory, but no building can hold him. And we got to keep that in mind um, in our lives as well, because sometimes we get into the thought of, I've got to be in the church building for this or that to happen, or I've got to take somebody to the church building for this or that to happen. And I hope you're seeing that that is not the case if you didn't know that before. Um, we see patterns through. We see Peter primarily starting to speak. He speaks uh, uh, in addressing the people. He uses Old Testament, and mm -hmm. there's a pattern to what he says, and we saw some of that again this week, and we're reminded of that, and then eventually we see um, in last week, we saw the selection of the seven and those seven men were selected by a criteria, and that criteria was that they be filled with the Spirit and that they be, um, I'm sorry, wisdom, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then um, the men are named. And then we see Stephen out of that group. And what part of what Stephen is able to do is speak with an amazing amount of wisdom and also perform signs and miracles. And then he's argued against, then he's brought to the council, and then he gives a testimony. So we start seeing someone besides Peter speaking to the same council that Jesus would have appeared before and that Peter and John have appeared before at least two other times. And each time part of the message is, you people did what to Jesus? Killed him. Killed him, right. And they even come back and say, you're trying to put the blood of this man on us. And at the time of Jesus's trial, they said, put the blood on us. You know, we, we're, the people said it, we're okay. So Jesus, Stephen gives a witness at the end of his witness, at the end of his speech, uh, what is the outcome? He stayed stronger. He is stoned to death, right? They, they push him outside the city. He's stoned to death. Um, he, there are some parallels between his, his death and Jesus's mm -hmm. in that he says, receive my spirit, which Jesus also said to the Father. Uh, Stephen is saying it to Jesus, but he also said, forgive them. As Jesus asked the Father to forgive, Stephen asked Jesus to forgive. And, uh, but he also gave a witness to what? Uh, when he looked up, what did you, what did Stephen tell them he was seeing? Jesus. Yes. Next, next to he was standing next to God. Standing next to the Father. Jesus yeah. had said to the people when they uh, to the high priests in particular during his life when he was asked, "Are you the Christ?" Jesus says, I am, and you will see me someday, you know, sitting at the, at the right hand of the Father. Over and over and over, it's said of Jesus that he's at the seated at the right hand of the Father, but here it says he's standing. That's mm -hmm. significant. It's very significant because the seated is an indication of sorts that his work is done. You know, what he did on earth and the death, burial, and resurrection, and then ascension, and the seating next to the father means that the father's gonna put things under his footstool. He's gonna put all of his enemies under his footstool and, and the work has been completed. Now, has everything been fulfilled? No, but the work of Christ has been fulfilled. So standing at this moment is a sense of, he's actively involved in what's going on with Stephen. He cares and he knows about it. Just think about that. If something is happening to you, when, when we'll see it later, but in Paul's conversion, when, when Jesus speaks to him, he mm -hmm. says, you've been persecuting me. And Paul says, who are you for me to persecute? I don't even know who you are. And Jesus says, when you do it to them, you do it to me. So that's how Jesus views you, by the way. Mm -hmm. Whatever happens to you, he takes it personally. So just see him standing when this is happening to Stephen. It's very significant. Okay, as a result, we go to the next chapter. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the beginning. This is a continuation of the story. Stephen has just been stoned. There is a man named Saul that stands there and people put their, uh, their cloaks or their uh, robes at his feet. And 
then it says, what does, we're going to look at this in all of these different uh, paragraphs that I've already got uh, written up here, if you want to write those down. And we're going to look at it in these sections of verses. So in verses one to three, we see the mention again of Saul. And what do we see about him? That he approved it. He approved the execution. Absolutely. So Saul approved um, Stephen's stoning or execution, right? He gave his hearty approval to it. So it kind of is passive in what he's mentioned when he's mentioned in, in chapter seven, that he's just standing there and people are putting their robes at his feet. I mean, that could have just been, hey, you, would you watch my stuff and it not be very active. But verse one of eight really says it. And it says he was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death, putting him to death. Now, what else happened on that day? What happened as a result of Stephen's martyrdom a great persecution against the church in jerusalem yes there is a great persecution now if you were going to title this chapter there's various ways you could title this chapter and i'm going to take just a second to talk about this at a glance chart okay there's mine mm -hmm. um, you have that in there all this is, is a tool that Precept Ministries, okay, has come up with. It's, there's nothing magical about it, but the beauty of it is if you put, if you fill it out, then you literally can just at a glance look down and say, this is what happened in chapter one. This is what happened in chapter four, or where was it that Stephen was stoned and I can go to chapter seven. You know, that's the at a glance part. Okay, up here it says book theme. I don't have that filled out yet because we've not looked at the whole book. In a lot of um, inductive studies, when you study a book, you study the whole book in an overview, a very high look at things rather than going into detail. And you can get a grasp or, of the whole and then put a book theme. And all of your chapter themes should support your book theme. For an instance, if I have something as a chapter theme and the book theme don't agree then one of them is wrong one of them it needs to be changed i hate to say wrong um, but the other is the segment divisions over here sorry the segment divisions over here there can be multiples and and it, there's what this does is god is a very organized god and so when he put it on their hearts to write these things even though he's speaking in their voices using their experiences and using the particular personalities of people he also is is um he's he's methodical it's and he's he's very um he has a way to do things. He has a plan and a purpose. So Kay pointed out one is it, and I just put it in this first one. You can put it whichever. I put witnessing in, and then I just drew a line under chapter seven and put Jerusalem, indicating that after chapter seven, they're going to possibly be witnessing somewhere else. I don't write it in. You could pencil it in and change it later if you want. I've got the author is Luke over here because that's one of the things we determine. The date Usually we don't get, you know, it doesn't say I'm writing in AD 44 or whatever. So a lot of times date is more about like maybe what, uh, what kingdom is ruling or what king is ruling or whatever else. It might be more that like time frame. Uh, purpose, if the book gives you a purpose and you can discern that, like John in the book of John, the gospel of John said uh, that he was writing these things to att the attesting miracles to attest to Jesus. Uh, for instance, um, Revelation gives, you know, right therefore these, the things which are, the things which shall be, and the you know, things will take place after these things. Key words, uh, you could probably write a lot of key words on here by now. Witnesses is one of them. Uh, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are always, uh, keywords, for instance. Uh, and then again, so that's what your, your at a glance chart is. Every now and then I've asked you like what the chapter is about. You're, you're not going to be, there's not one way to answer that. Like I may say of this chapter, I may say great persecution, church ravaged and scattered, gospel presented or gospel preached is what I wrote. Sorry, I'm reading. I'm trying to read what I wrote. That would be my chapter theme. Um, yours might be 
uh, Stephen went to Samaria, I'm sorry, Philip went to Samaria, uh, Peter and John followed, Holy Spirit uh, came on the people, and then Philip and the eunuch. Okay, would both of them be right? Yeah, yeah. both of them would be right. Um, and I'll be honest with you, in the very beginning when I first started doing studies, I would go into the discussion and the leader would kind of help us to see whatever the chapter title was. And I'd look at mine and I wouldn't like it or I'd think, oh, I didn't get it right. And I would maybe erase it or mark it out. Don't do that. Keep yours because that's what you came up with at that time. That's something that God laid on your heart. Now, if you put the chapter title for chapter eight was that um, uh, the kingdom was divided and Samaria is in the north, I would say that's probably not the theme of the chapter. <laughs> Are this true? Yeah, but that's probably not the theme of the chapter. So you want to be able to look down at it and say, I remember what happened in that chapter because this is what I wrote. Okay. So again, I wrote the great persecution Um, church, uh, I can't write, church, scattered, gospel preached, church ravaged and scattered, gospel preached. That's what I wrote. I didn't even mention Philip, but I could, I could have. Um, you can write yours, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of where, what I put up for mine. Okay, so this great, great persecution happens on that day. Okay, as a result, I've already mentioned it in my, my chapter theme, but as a result, what happened to the church in Jerusalem? They scattered. Right. 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 Meaning they left Jerusalem, right? Who stayed in Jerusalem? Peter and John. Yes, Peter and John in particular, the apostles. So at least the 12. Uh, they're my, you know, they, depending on what their definition of the apostles is. Um, but at least those, the rest of people were scattered. And it says, um, some devout men buried Stephen. So let's get practical here. Stephen has died. Some buried him and made loud lamentation over him. I mean, he was mourned. Um, and then in verse three, who in particular begins to do something? Saul. Saul. Right. So as part of this persecution, Saul ravages. And he ravages the, um, the church, it says, which means the believers. There's not a building. That's not what he's ravaging. He's ravaging people. Um, he enters house after house and drags off men and he puts them in prison, right? Men and women. Yes. Men and women into prison. Now, notice it says he enters houses. He's got some authority to be able to just barge into somebody's house. And can you imagine this time? Just... No. Right now, we're sitting here comfortably talking about the word of God. Let's say we were doing this, you know, under the radar um, and in our country. In our country, it is illegal to do this. Let's say it's not, but let's say it is. There are countries in the world right now where it's illegal to do what we're doing right now. Lynn knows about that. Lynn just talked about being a uh, English as a second language in China. There's a official China church. And then there's the underground China church, which is the real, the official may have some real believers in it if they feel like they're trying to help out within it. But the official overall church of China is, it's, it's run by the state, run by the, the country in a very, and if they're listening, which they probably are, <laughs> it's not a good thing. Um, I'm just going to go on record as saying, but um that's what this is exactly what they're facing in that country. They're facing this being life or death, moment by moment, scared. There's other parts of the world. In Muslim countries, you will lose your everything. If you if you don't lose your life, you lose your life. You don't maybe get killed, but probably could, but you could lose everything. House, home, family, turned out, everything. 
and worse can happen to you. And then they can also kill you. Um, it's, but we don't face that right now. Mm -hmm. um, we could here in America someday, but that's what Saul was doing. He was going house to house and dragging people away and putting them in prison. What do you think the result of them being in prison might be? Maybe a revival starting to happen, witnessing in prison? Could be, that could definitely happen. Um, what could be the result of the government imprisoning them? What, what might their goal be for these people? Kill what do you them. know historically? Kill them. Yeah, they could be killed. They could, more martyrs could happen as a result. Well, but we don't see that said here, but they are imprisoned. And as a result, the people that can scatter, leave, get out of Jerusalem before they're imprisoned, um, because it's a real thing. We're not talking about somebody shaking their finger in their face or getting upset with them. We're talking ravaged. This is bad. Um, okay, so as you looked this week, okay, so. Um, when they were scattered, we're going into verses four to eight, what did they do? They preached the word. Right. <laughs> they are scattered. Uh, they preached. Wherever they went. Kind of cool, right? Um, so sometimes this is called the diaspora or a version of the diaspora, meaning that they were divided or, or uh, moved out of uh, Jerusalem. Um, they were scattered about and they, they began to preach the word. And in particular, we start seeing one person. And who is that? Philip. Philip, Philip. right. Okay, you looked up Philip this week. Who is Philip? He's one of the seven that yeah. was selected with Stephen and Yes. He's it's one interesting, he and Stephen both, they were selected to help widows, but yet they, they were evangelists. Yes. They went out evangelizing. Yes. Um, very, like we even talked last week when we looked at those, that criteria, you know, we were saying other, you know, all they're going to do. Their task that they were selected to do was to wait tables, make sure the widows got fed, and yet they had this really high quality uh, qualification needed. And then you see Stephen go out, and first thing Stephen starts, one of the things Stephen starts doing is performing signs and miracles and teaching in a, in a powerful way with great wisdom, and he's imprisoned for it and then killed for it. And this didn't stop Philip, did it? You think Philip knew about what happened to Stephen? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was there. He witnessed it. And he was one of that seven. So he would have known. Um, so what he does is, as part of being scattered, he and, and the people that were scattered preached, Philip goes to where? The city of Samaria. Right. Okay, and you made a distinction in your voice. Why did you make a distinction in your voice? Well, because there's a region of Samaria and there's a city. Yes, there's a region called Samaria and then there's a city of Samaria. You looked up a little bit of the historical background for Samaria because it's important to understand who these people are and where they're going. But there's also another significance to Samaria, and that is what did Jesus tell them before he ascended? that they were you tell the apostles that they were going to witness from jerusalem to samaria to uh judea, judea. do i have that backwards there somewhat <laughs> uh, not really backwards but jerusalem judea. in the region of judea and then, and then got, samaria and then to the ends of the earth exactly exactly um and then we saw other accounts of scripture and in the gospels where it talks about that they were to go to the nations um, and in the um, what we call the great commission at the end of matthew we see not necessarily the mentioning of those regions but it's go go <laughs> go make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the of the, of the father son and the holy spirit and they were to go to the nations Okay, so were they to go to Jerusalem? Yes, because Jesus told them to. And, but were they to stay in Jerusalem? 
No. no. Now, were they wrong to have not left yet? No. Not necessarily. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Um, but I just wanted us to think um, because sometimes God has to do something pretty major to boot us out of our comfortable place. Well, you know, that's what, when we got to the point of the commentaries, that's where I got that as I read that they weren't necessarily, you know, they weren't wrong. And it also said that the Christians didn't necessarily do something wrong when they were persecuted and scattered. Sometimes that just jumped out at me because sometimes I think if, you know, if there was obedience to God, you know, it would maybe wouldn't have the persecution, but. That's, that's a really good, valid, valid, valid point, because I know in my personal life, whenever I have like negative feedback or opposition, I, I have the type of personality that thinks I've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and honestly, if, even if I get beyond that saying, okay, I didn't do anything. I, well, obviously I can't be perfect, but I didn't do anything to deserve this reaction. I have others that will tell me. I'm not having that reaction. So if you're getting that reaction, you must have done something wrong. But mm -hmm. reality is, what did Jesus promise us? Trouble. Yeah. Why? I mean, where was it going to come from? If they hated, if they hate us, they hated him. Is that what you're? That, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly what I'm trying. It's to really say. against Jesus and against the father. It's really. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the more we are identified by others as being like Christ, the more they're going to hate us. Yes. So it's really counter to what you were saying. And what I'm saying that is my reaction a lot of times is if we're involved in, I mean, I hesitate to say that anything I have experienced is persecution because I haven't had somebody running into my house and dragging me off to prison because of my beliefs. But if I've been opposed because I am truly standing on God's word and living it out and I'm opposed, that is persecution. They hate my words. They hate my belief system. They hate the way I'm acting because they're opposed to it. And if I'm on God's side, <laughs> they're really opposed to God. And I do believe this is going to increase. I do believe um, that it's going to come to America. I think we're already seeing some of the signs of it. Um, it's just crept in rather than, you know, been busting through our doors necessarily. Um, so I like that we're on the same page. When they were scattered and when this persecution happened, it wasn't as a result of having done something wrong, even though it would look that way. Um, and it wasn't staying like God didn't have to. I mean, well, in a way, God did orchestrate this and they were scattered. But what did they do? They went and preached. They did exactly what they should have done. So we have to look at it and say, how do we apply this to us? I feel like when it comes to persecution, that's like our signal that we're doing something right. You know, that we are standing. I was just talking in devotions with my office this morning about standing in truth, like being grounded in truth, um, and how when you're grounded, you, you don't get knocked over. Um, and just kind of that mindset of like they, they were imprisoned because they were doing what Christ was calling them to do. So when they got out of prison, why the heck wouldn't they go back and do exactly what Christ called them to do? They weren't wrong. Um, and so anytime that <clears throat> anything has come at me, whether it be like hardcore spiritual warfare, whether it be, you know, a person coming at me, like whatever. Um, and I've been able to, because I'm not always good at this. I've been able to identify like, oh, this is kind of a persecution moment, um, you know, whatever. It kind of makes you go, well, then I'm just going to keep doing it. Like if that is what's happening to me, then what I've been doing is the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, that one's hard though, when it's like a personal, pro you know, problem or like that kind of stuff. Cause you're like, oh shoot, did I hurt their family? You know, whatever. It's like, well, truth kind of hurts sometimes or, you know, things like that. But yeah, persecution to me is always the sign that I'm doing something right, even though it sucks. Well, and within what you said, you're, you're evaluating, like you're self-evaluating. Like if I've just been abrasive and I just was in a bad mood and I just mouthed off and somebody gets upset with me, I can't claim that as persecution. <laughs> 
maybe I'm the persecutor. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if we are, if, if, if we've made a strong stand and, and we're solid, like you're saying, grounded, like we're not going to be knocked over, not going to be knocked off this truth, we're just standing on God's word, then, um, yeah, those errors are going to fly. Do you think mainly the truth that they stood in, though, was Christ crucified, that they had killed him, that he was buried and he was raised again? I mean, well, that's really the truth they stood in, though, right? Or, well, and I feel like part of that, it's like that. That's what they were preaching and that's what they believed in. But the other truth was that commission, like the great commission that, you know, Christ left them with is like, go and preach the gospel to all the nations. Like that that's what they were doing to get like so they were speaking the truth of of the of who christ was and what he did for us but then they were also doing what he called them to do and like that truth of like i know i'm doing what, what christ has called me to do i think it's kind of twofold i definitely agree with both i don't think y'all are uh, you know at odds i think you're both both right and that's actually part of what we did this week is look at what is it? What, what would we say are the elements of the gospel? This is the first book where in the book, this is sorry, the first chapter in the book of Acts where gospel is mentioned. Okay. We know if, well, you might not have looked it up or you might not have heard this before, but the word gospel means good news, right? But in order for there to be good news, there has to be a contrast, bad news, right? It's not just let's all know you are committing adultery that's what jesus said you're committing adultery go and don't do that anymore um he didn't say it was an affair <laughs> right. um so we have a tendency to make things sound a little bit better um but he was preaching the word and you saw in the definition this week of what the gospel elements are um what are they you tell me what did, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? That he was crucified. Right. He died. He, Jesus died. And it was according to scripture. Someone will put according to scripture, ATS. As a result of dying, what was he? He, he was, died. He died. He was buried. He was resurrected. He was buried. He was resurrected, and the resurrected was according to scripture. And then what happened after the resurrection? He appeared to many people. Yeah. yeah. And he did it for our sins. He did it for our forgiveness. Yeah, okay, very good. Jesus died for our- The forgiveness of our sins. For the forgiveness of our sins according to scripture. Um, and I, I'm, I'm putting it this way. I think you can read it. Jesus died according to scripture. You can write that out. I just put ATS uh, for our sins, for, um, for forgiveness of our sins. According to scripture, he was buried. The buried is the proof of the death. You don't bury something that didn't die. Yes. Okay. He was resurrected according to scripture. And he, and that he appeared to many. That's the proof of the resurrection. Yes. Okay. So that I have them as sub points for that reason. So really the two main points of the gospel are Jesus died and Jesus was resurrected. Notice it didn't say Jesus was born. Notice it didn't say Jesus lived. Now, was he born? Yes. Was the facts around his birth important? Yes. And those were also according to scripture. Was his life important? Absolutely. It's an amazing example for us of, of what we are to live like and what he said and what he did and be like him. So mm -hmm. yes, but the gospel is his death. Yes. The burial proved it. His resurrection and the appearance proved it. Mm -hmm. And the resurrection proves that God was satisfied. Mm -hmm. You can read through Romans and all that and get a lot of those, um, great words there, big long words there, um, all the shuns. But um, so this is, this is, these are elements of the gospel. Um, salvation is only in one man's name. So are there other paths to God? No. no. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
and no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. It says by, but it, it literally means through Jesus. So mm -hmm. he's the door. He's the gate. He's the illustration of the only one way into the tabernacle, only one way into the temple. He's all of them. It's yes. all pictured for us over and over and over again. Okay, we do need to move on. Um, I love this though. <laughs> I love this stuff. Yeah. That is, so to answer what were they preaching, um, it wouldn't it be great to have their sermon outlines? It would be yeah. awesome, but we have it. What has Peter mm -hmm. been saying? What did Stephen say? All of this, as you look back through those messages, you saw those elements of the gospel in what they were already saying what they were told to say when Jesus was alive, what they were told to say before Jesus ascended after his resurrection and what they're saying over and over again. And what Paul later puts down for us, this Saul guy <laughs> to put down for us um, to remember is his death and his resurrection, his burial and the appearance to many. Mm -hmm. Those are important aspects. It makes it really simple when you can get it down to two mm -hmm. with a couple of sub points. Um, but so, so what were they preaching? They, this is what they're preaching. It says they preached the word and it says, or preaching the word, and it says Philip went to Samaria and was proclaiming Christ to them. Proclaiming Christ, remember, always convert the word Christ to Messiah in your brain so that you realize this is the one that all those generations and thousands of years prior to this were looking forward to in faith. Abraham being one, looked forward to a time, but he was still reckoned as righteous because he believed that God was going to do it. And it being bring the Christ and that, that Christ be the savior of the world. Christ is important. So when he's proclaiming Christ, he's saying what Jesus said to the woman at the well. Who was the woman at the well? You looked that up this week. Sophie mentioned it earlier. Who was the woman at the well? What nationality? Samaritan. Samaritan. Samaritan, right? What are you saying? Samaritan. You said Samaritan, right? Yes. Okay. I thought you said American. Oh. <laughs> I need to turn it back. Right. Um, yeah. So we just A got question, and I don't know where it falls in here, but I, and I can't find it right now, but I think we were asked, were Samaritans Gentiles? Okay, great, great, great question. Okay, is this the yeah. wrong time for that? No, 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 it's not because we brought up Samaritans. Who were the Samaritans? What's our background on them? Well, they. The background was that when uh, the king of Assyria, instead of filling uh, Samaria with G the house of Israel, he brought in people from other places and so they worshiped um, their own gods and mm -hmm. burned up their children and mm -hmm. you know and um, so he sent a priest right um, and it sounds like I don't know maybe some listened to him but it it wasn't uh, so are they Gentiles or are they a mix <laughs> I yes to Gentiles, but then as I got through, I thought, well, Where are they? Right. Okay. So let, can you just put a pin on it for a second? I can. I can. No, I, I, we're, we're going there. Um, Samaria is right here. This is the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. You've got this map if you want to look at it. Jordan and Judea and Jerusalem are down here. Okay. Notice above Samaria is a town called Nazareth. Yes. And above Nazareth is the Sea of Galilee and an area called Galilee. Guess where Peter, James, John, and Andrew are from? They are Galileans. Yeah. Okay. So is this all part of the nation of Israel? And yeah. if all of this is part of the nation of Israel. Yeah. And Samaria is right there. I think I've got it right. Yeah. Samaria is right there. So are they part of the nation? land of Israel. Are they part of the yes. land? land. Yes. 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 Okay. yes. So the history is that after Solomon, you have Solomon's son Rehoboam, and Rehoboam um, in his days, he caused some problems. <laughs> and yeah. a guy named Jeroboam came in and God had already 
chosen Jeroboam, but Jeroboam took 10 of the tribes, and then so we call that the northern kingdom, and left, Solom left Solomon's son, Rehoboam, with the southern kingdom, which only included Judea and, and um, Benjamin those two tribes, Judea, because David is from the tribe of Judah, Solomon was his son, and, and Rehoboam was his grandson, so in the southern kingdom, and I'm reading through first and second kingdom, it's really fresh, all of the kings of the southern kingdom are descendants of David, none of the kingdom, kings of this northern kingdom are descendants of David, none, some of the kings of the southern kingdom are did right in God's eyes and followed the ways of David, who had a heart for God. None of the northern kingdom, none. They never had a king that followed God. As a matter of fact, Jeroboam, the first king, set up two calves in Dan and Bethel and said, if they go back to Jerusalem, their hearts are going to return to Jerusalem. Their hearts are going to return to that king. So I'm going to set up my worship centers up here. And they worshiped in the northern kingdom. Um, so go a few kings in and you get the king called Omri. And Omri chose the city of Samaria as the capital of the northern kingdom. So Samaria the city is a city in a region called Samaria, but at the time of the division of the kingdom, a few kings in, you've got, and he wasn't a descendant of Jeroboam, as a matter of fact, because God cut off all of Jeroboam. Omri came along. Omri is the dad of Ahab. Ahab's the one that was married to Jezebel. If you know anything, you know about Jezebel. Um, so bad kings, bad kings. And anyway, they chose Samaria, the city. That's where the capital of the northern kingdom was from that point forward. So again, we have a city and we have a region. In the days of Jesus, or in the in-between times, after many kings of the northern kingdom they just kept defying god and god had them taken captive into the into assyria where it says syria up here into the nation of assyria um and none of us in, in syria by the way um but he had them taken and it was the the usual practices of those those conquering kings to take literally people out of that area and then replace them. So what he replaced them with is other kingdoms he had conquered, including Babylon, and he put those people into the area uh, around some Samaria. And therefore, if there were any straggling Israelites, Northern Kingdom people there, then they might have intermarried. So that's where the mix comes in. You mentioned the mix, are they mixed? race in yes mixed um nationality i shouldn't say race um and so over time and as you were telling the story that we looked up in second kings you you start seeing what happens is that the animals were killing them and they they sent back to the king and said you got to do something so he sent a priest to tell them superstitiously how to please the god of that land Oh, he wasn't even a good priest. Not really. I mean, he okay. might have known and he himself might have taught them the truth, but the people were looking for a good luck charm. Okay. The people that were living there, which were not Israelites, were saying, we're in a strange land. We're getting killed. You got to help us out and give us a rule book. And this priest comes along and says, well, if you'll do these things. And they're like, okay, we'll just tack them on what we're doing. They kept their gods and their practices. They just tacked this stuff on and hoped it would work. You know, cross my fingers, hope it works. And therefore, when Jesus is asked, he says, or when Jesus is talking to his followers in his ministry, his life ministry, he told them that the message was that he came for, the people he came for were the Israelites. He came for the house of Israel. And he said to his, his disciples, don't go to the cities in Samaria. So did he consider them Israelites? No. No. Uh -huh. So if you categorize people into two categories, Jew and Gentile, where would Jesus have put the Samaritans? I guess the Gentiles. Right. That's okay. what I thought originally, but then I 
That's how I was. If you kind of want to make it three, then it's <laughs> Jew, Samaritan, and Gentile. But really, it's usually two, and it's Jew and Gentile. So the Samaritans would have been considered more Gentile. But the beauty of it is, the very first person that Jesus actually declared himself to be the Messiah to was the woman at the well. Yeah. I you know, Jesus did, <laughs> he did distinguish though, don't go to the Gentile, don't go to Samaria and don't go to the Gentiles. Yes. So it's, it's kind of like he separated them out a little bit too, but he did not consider them of the nation of Israel. Okay. But notice it's like smack dab right here and he lived above them. Do you think he might have been involved with them enough to know what they were like when he was growing up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they would have, uh, and he tells the story. If I said Samaritan to you, probably the first story that came to your mind was the good Samaritan. Yes. Mm -hmm. When Jesus talks about the man who was hurt and the priest came along and uh, I think a Levite came along, I were, like there were two different, it should have done something to help him. And then the Samaritan comes along and he's the one that actually, and Jesus said, who was the neighbor? And they said the Samaritan, the one that helped him. Now that would have, that would have stuck in their craw to have mm -hmm. said that as a Jewish person. They looked down on the Samaritans and had nothing to do with them. The woman at the well said, why are you even speaking to me? Um, not because of who she was, which you find out in the story, but the fact that she was a Samaritan. And her views of the religious practices are a little skewed. Like she says, the Jews think that we have to, to worship in Jerusalem, but my people work, worship on this mountain. Yeah. They have their own mountain of worship. And, um, and Jesus says to her, there'll come a time when, you know, those places aren't important, but he did say salvation is from the Jews. Now, he's, in other words, Jesus is from the Jews. And so um, salvation comes through the true belief in God. We'll leave it there. Um, and we need to move on. But we've got, um, we've got Philip in Samaria. We know who the Samarians or Samaritans are. And Philip is preaching and he's doing signs and wonders. Um, then you've got this other person in verses 9 through 13. And who is there? Who is that? Simon. 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 Now, this is not Simon Peter. This is Simon the magician. And he has been um, wowing people. They even call him the great power of God. I think the um, yeah. ESV says power of God, the great or something like that. It, you know, but anyway, they, they believe this power is, you know, like, in other words, they still have that religiosity that understands there is one God called, you know, Elo Elohim or Yahweh. And so they they kind of have that nodding acquaintance with it. Okay. But um, he, in verse 12 says, when the people that are listening to Philip believed, remember they believed, um, because he was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were being baptized, right? So you've got people believed and were baptized. And then in verses, uh, the next paragraph is verse 14 to 24, but we're going to break it into two parts, verse 14 to 17, and then on. Um, who comes to Samaria? Peter and John. Right. Peter and John. Peter and John. What did they come to do? What was their purpose? To pray for them and to... Um, lay their hands on them so they could receive the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. Yes. They had heard all the apostles in Jerusalem. Remember the Jerusalem, uh, the apostles had not left Jerusalem when people were scattered. The word got back um, in a good way that there's this movement going on, this thing's going on. Philip has, uh, people are believing and they're being baptized. So the apostles sent, um, sent Peter and John in particular down there. Um, and, and by the way, 
down to us usually means south. But any reference in scripture to down, well, any reference in scripture to a geographic location is based on Israel. So it's either to the east, north, what south, or west of Israel. But in the case of within Israel, Jerusalem is at the highest point. So whenever you leave Jerusalem, which direction are you going? Down. down. <laughs> okay, so when they say down from Jerusalem, like Philip went down from Jerusalem, um, they're talking about he left the hillside, you know, he left the mountain and went down, but he went north. So just so you know. Um, so he went down to Samaria, and in this case, they went down to Samaria um, because they had heard that people had received the word of God and were being baptized. Um, and so they came that these people might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, did this cause any problems for you? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I read a commentary, though, that really helped. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, um, what, under, what I understand at this point in time <laughs> is I think Jesus, in these verses, this commentary said that they had, that um, uh, God was, or the Holy Spirit was connecting them with the church at Jerusalem because of this division. And they even compared it to the Gentiles that were that are going to receive the Holy Spirit later. Okay. That, um, Peter goes and speaks. I take it as, as God had a purpose. Like I always work, it always bothered me that Jesus, you know, it's like only preach to the Jews, don't preach to this, you know, in my mindset, mm -hmm. whoever, but I think there was an overall plan of how he was going to bring people together. That's a very good way of putting it. And that I kind of made sense. Yeah, it helps. <laughs> but um, I'm still mulling it. <laughs> very good, because I'm just going to tell you a little bit of preview. When we get to chapters 10 and 11, we're going to look at this more carefully. Um, right now, basically, I think what you said was great. I think there's a plan and a purpose in it. I think that we can at least see, this is one of those places where I go, let me just see what it says. And, and let's just stick with what it says. And, and keep thinking about it. And remembering that God doesn't usually ever reveal everything about anything in one place. It's a progressive revelation. So we're gonna progress through, but I, I think that's great that, yeah, there, there's a purpose in this. And so if we can just kinda of say, let's just accept it. There's a purpose in it. They, these people in Samaria were hearing, hearing from Philip, preaching Jesus, preaching the word, preaching the good news. These are different things that it says that he was doing and they received the word and they were believing and they were being baptized. Then Peter and John come to lay hands on them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if this was a misunderstanding on the apostles part or they're messing with something they don't need to be messed with, I think we would be told that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they come and they lay hands on them and these people do receive the Holy Spirit as a result, means there was something to this, mm -hmm. okay? And basically right now, that's about as far as we can go with it <laughs> without taking the time, in which we didn't do this week, and studying this more. So let's just take what it says and just leave it as fact and right there. But we also see this Simon guy who, um, who watches this and what does he want? He wants to be able to lay his hands and give people power. Right. It didn't even say that he wanted to make sure he had the spirit, I don't think. It's like, I want to let, let's see, verse 19, give me this power also that so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Right. He just, he just wanted the power. Yeah. Right. In his yeah. mind, probably the magic of it all. Yeah. I mean, and again, that goes back to what was, what was he before this? Um, he had called himself, like he would proclaim of himself that he had great power, that he was a great person. Yes. They called him the great power of God. He was pretty puffed up. And then he watches Philip and he's going, you know, this is pretty real. This is pretty cool. 
and he follows Philip and he listens to Philip and it says he believed Philip. And then when he's talking to Peter, Peter calls him out. That knee, I mean, it's like Sophie was saying earlier, there's no pulling punches here. Peter calls yeah. him out and his description of this man is what? What does he say about him? In the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Right. And, and yeah. may you perish and your heart is not right with God and all of that. Does that sound like the description of a Christian, a believer? No. No. It's a, it's no, but you know, the first time I read through this, I really thought, because I, you know, just reading through quickly before I really right. dug into it and studied with this, I took, um, I just, I think, assumed verse 24 when he prayed that nothing like that would happen. I, I, my first thought was he repented, but it doesn't say that. <laughs> but right. I just thought, um, yeah, I thought he was okay after. <laughs> and he might have been after. Because Peter's saying this about him before he says that last thing. Please pray. I guess me. my point I'm, to myself is one quick read. I got one thought. And as I studied, I started seeing him in a whole different way. Right. Um, what we're, one of the things that we can say is we're beginning to see with the, the uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, who were among the people living communally, we saw that they were not really true. And then you see here, Simon, who sees the signs and miracles, is affected by them and believes, but it, it proves out his heart here afterwards that he's not truly a believer. Now, he might have become one. We don't know that part, but I'm just saying when Peter's calling him out for wanting this power, that's what he wanted. He wanted to pay for the power and they're like, you know, rebuking him. Okay. Whether or not he gets saved, we'll just leave that because that's up to God. But verse 25 says that when Peter and John were finished, what did they do? They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Right. So they returned to Jerusalem and preached along the way. Okay. Are we seeing a pattern yeah. with all these people, wherever they go, what are they doing? Preaching the gospel. Preaching yeah. the gospel. Taking every opportunity, right? Okay, we're going to very quickly go through. It's a lot. It's a big section, but it's a wonderful story. We see Philip again. Philip, who is in Samaria, right? That's where he's been. He's been in Samaria. My orange is, is Philip's journeys. He left Jerusalem. He went to Samaria. And then what happens? What's the, what are these verses 26 to 40? Who speaks to him? Why does he go where he went? The spirit spoke to him and told him to go over to the um, man that was reading Isaiah. Okay. He was a unit. Right. Um, first, it's an angel speaking to him and says, go. And apparently, yes. physically, Phil, Phil moved, physically left. And so he would have gone from Samaria, the, the town of Samaria, down. And I just have this, this road over here, and you don't know where he lands. But I'm just, like, connecting it there. Um, amazing coincidence, right? Mm -hmm. Philip just decides to go. He meets up with this guy, or when he gets there, he sees this eunuch in a chariot, and he starts running up to him because that's when the angels, I mean, sorry, the spirit says, go up to him. So Philip yeah. does. Philip yeah. goes up to him, and this guy, he overhears this guy reading. Um, and the, so when he finishes, when, Philip, when the guy finishes reading, um, Philip says, do you know what it is that you've just read? And the man says, what? You need someone to explain it to him. Right. I need a guide. I need somebody to explain mm -hmm. it to me. So what does Philip do? He climbs up in the chariot, but what does he do? <laughs> well, he starts with the scripture that, yeah. with Isaiah. He starts where the Ethiopian is. Exactly. And I think that's a good point. Yes, to very good. To start where people right. are. Paul did that. So you've got 
apart from the fact that we're not going to discuss what a eunuch is, but I think we all know what a eunuch is, but we yeah. see his credentials. He's from the court of the queen. He's her treasurer, but he's also leaving Jerusalem where he went to worship. So what do you know about this man? He was seeking. Yeah. He's he was worshiper. seeking the truth. Right. And he, he made a big trip. That's from, from uh, uh, Ethiopia, which is down the coast of Africa, up all the way to Jerusalem would not have been an easy way to go. I don't know if you realize this, but there is a road that's called the King's Highway that actually goes down from, goes through Jerusalem and down through Israel and back down to uh, Egypt, Africa, and all of that. And then there's another road that comes east-west, that, and there's a crossroads at Jerusalem. Again, I don't believe in coincidences. God put Jerusalem there for a reason. So you've got all of these people traversing this area and crossing through Jerusalem. But this guy had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning back to Ethiopia. So he was returning. Philip is told, go, go to this road. So he goes to the road. He gets there. He sees this guy. The guy says, come up. You know, he's running along. He, or spirits tells Philip to run up, tells him to get in the chariot. He's reading this one particular passage. Now, when you read these verses here in Acts, they don't jump, like, we kind of know what they mean. Well, did, I hope you went to, to Isaiah and read it all. If you read Isaiah 53, is there any doubt what Isaiah 50, who Isaiah 53 is talking about? No. No. It's, it's amazing yeah. what was said through Isaiah all those years before Jesus ever was was incarnate it's incredible but it's mm -hmm. obviously about jesus so yes. philip listens to this man reading this passage it would have been a scroll the fact that he owned scripture is is huge yeah. it's not everybody on scripture he's reading this passage philip who's fairly uneducated but has lots of wisdom and god using his spirit helps him and says i'm well, not says he does it he takes this scripture and from this scripture, he preaches Jesus. Yes. And I think, I think it was, oh, I don't remember who said it. I heard, the, heard somebody say, I find this to be significant. I agree. What is significant about him doing that? What does that say to us? I don't know if this is what you mean, but uh, yes. that we meet people where they are. Yeah. Is that what you're... I, am. I mean, Stephen, when Stephen was giving his speech, he was talking to people that knew all that history. So he was meeting right. them where they were. Uh, it, it's just, uh, to me, that's what it is. I, I agree. When you meet somebody, you know, and a good place to start when I'm getting out of this is, you know, the gospel, the basic Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus died, buried, and was, was raised, and then from that. And I agree with you totally. I totally agree with you. But I'm just going to say, when you say the gospel, most of the time we're talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. But the gospel is the good news of Christ. And every one of these situations, they're not using Matthew through Revelation. They're using Old Testament. Yeah. So what does that tell you about the Old Testament? Can you, can you, yeah, can you preach the gospel from the Old Testament? Yes, yes, it's there. And, and as a church member, we have a tendency to separate it and say Old yes. Testament is about Israel, New Testament is about the church. Jesus is all over it. Yes. And, Don't and, you think to someone, though, that doesn't know anything or doesn't know Christ, it's a lot quicker to start with the New Testament. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. then all the history. Absolutely. I mean, if I if I had somebody that didn't know anything but was interested, I'd probably say read John. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would, I, or you know, help him out or take him through a study. But yeah, I totally agree with that. I'm just saying that. Yes, I agree. He <laughs> is he was using what the man was reading? He was using the the conversation at hand. He was taking the man from where he was to where he needed to go rather than here's what he did not do he did not say you are in jerusalem you're a believer you're reading scripture you're a believer right he didn't do that did he 
No, he said, you're here. Let me take you where you need to go. But don't give anybody assurance because they have a few of the looks or blessings or whatever. Um, find out. And, and take them, this is, this is, a, it's exhortation. The idea of exhortation is taking somebody from the place that they are to where they need to go and coming alongside them, putting your arm around them. Philip got in the chariot with this man and, and rode along with him. But also Philip is known here for angels spoke to him, he went. Didn't say, why, how am I going to get there? I don't have a chariot. He just went. And the timing was perfect. You know, Philip orchestrated that, right? Um, timing was perfect. He meets up with this guy, and the guy doesn't even question that part. It's kind of incredible. But as a result of Stephen's teaching, there's a body of water, and what does the man say? He wanted to be baptized. Yeah. Baptize him. Look, what prevents me from being baptized? Great question, by the way. What is Philip's answer? He doesn't say, yeah, come on. What does he say? He asked him what he, he about Jesus, that he believed in his heart who Jesus was. Right. He said, if you believe with all your heart, you heart. may. Yeah. Right? And the yeah. man answers, this is a good answer, and he says, I believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, is the Son of God. Yes. Remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Yes. Peter's answer was the Son of God, God. right? Yes. It's, it's, a, it's an important answer. Um, and so he ordered the chariot to stop. They got in the water. Philip, um, as well as the eunuch, Philip baptized the eunuch. As he comes up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord does what to Philip? He took him. That's the reason I made a big point about physically yeah. Philip got there. Yeah. But Philip, all of a sudden, he's he's snatched away and he's in a different town called Azatos. Um, I think it has another name as well, but Ashdod is another name for it. But Azatos, which on your map is just not far away. Um, and then he just keeps going. And he kept he, preaching the gospel the to all the towns. Everywhere he went, he preached yeah. the gospel. And he ends up in what town? Caesarea. Caesarea. And that's yeah. important because we're going to see him later. And you looked him up uh, as you went forward yes. a little bit to see. Uh, but he ends up in Caesarea. So yeah. when you looked up that verse, which is in, I forgot which chapter, maybe 10, of Acts, whatever chapter it is, uh, Philip is called an evangelist, by the way. Definitely is. He is. We're seeing it here. Okay. But does it cause you any problems that Philip was snatched and, and dropped off somewhere? <laughs> I've heard that all my life. So yeah. I guess. <laughs> right. Okay. We need to stop. Yeah. Now, I keep thinking I'm going to keep the time down, but I didn't. So we need to stop. But this is amazing stuff. And all of our questions are not going to be answered. Um, Hopefully they will be over time, but I'm just saying as we encounter something in one moment. But I do believe that in this particular controversial, controversial idea of believing and receiving the Holy Spirit, just hang in there and we'll study it yes. further. But I do believe there's some purpose in this moment. And I think we're going to see that later also. So um, anyway, we'll close and then we'll, I'll have the video up at uh, about 12 or 13 after. Give yourself a break uh, to go to the bathroom. I'll get it set up. Um, and for those of you. Excuse me. Did you say something before I logged on about X part two? Oh, I was, saying, um, I was saying that we're on um, the sixth lesson of eight. And most people that I've heard from so far don't have a problem moving to Tuesday. Okay, Nobody I don't either. Said they do. So, yes. and then I haven't really addressed whether or not we want to take a break or if you want to just go right into part two. But if you want to go ahead and buy part two, do, because we're going to do it. I'm going to do it if you want to do it with me. 
I just don't know that we're going to go the next week into it or if we're going to take a, a little bit of a break. And I'll, I'll let you know that decision pretty soon. Okay. Um, but we will be doing it and I'll let you know that. And I hope you'll join us and, and let your friends know. Um, I'll be putting it up on the precept side again um, once I decide on the timing. Um, and I think it's another eight week. I think it's about the same length of time. Um, so it'd be about the same price, but uh, you can invite friends. Obviously there's, there's a limit of like a hundred. We don't, we haven't hit that limit right now. I think we've got nine on here. I think we had as many as maybe 11 uh, today, but um, anyway, if you have to go, you have to go. Uh, I, I, I am trying to keep this, but I love the discussion. So I don't want us to, to, to cut anything out, but um, we are going to stop and I'm going to pray and it's 12 after now. So it'll be 15 after before I start the video. Um, Heavenly Father, we praise you and lift your name on high. We thank you, Father, for challenging our brains and giving us this amazing story because these are times that are incredible with signs and miracles and wonders, and we are wondering about some of them, And but we just love what we can take from it. We can see these patterns of wherever, in whatever situation, no matter what, using whatever is available to us and, and whatever is in a person's life, we're gonna use to take them from there and preach Jesus and preach the good news and take them to the truth mm -hmm. so that they aren't left where they are, at least as much as is possible with me. As you give us these opportunities, Father, we just ask that you will open our minds and eyes to them and make us aware and that we would be willing, just like they were willing, and it might cost us everything. So we just pray that you would give us the confidence and the courage, just like this group asked for themselves, and we're seeing it. The, the more that they're press, the, the more the opposition is pressing in, the more that it's coming out in them, that they're bold and they're going and they're preaching and more and more people are hearing the truth. It's still the same thing that we need to be doing today. So we just ask that you put that on our hearts. We thank you for our time together, for the lesson we're going to get from Kay. We thank you for the lessons that are coming up as well in this chapter, this, this part of Acts. 